um, I wonder, I was just thinking about how much movement we'll get out of these lines. We know they've been feeding on a buffalo for the last three days, so they're still very full. Um, this male, however, did move quite away from the, the brothers, the three brothers, or his three brothers. And um, it just shows you these co these coalitions at times, they do meet up, they do spend time together, but then they'll move around, patrol their territory, mark different areas. So it was really great to see all four of them together again. It's the first time I've seen all four of them together. I think I've seen three together. That was the most I'd seen before. Um, but now they'll most likely split up again, go their separate ways, mark different parts of the territory and maybe meet up again. Occasionally we see two of them together, sometimes one by himself like this. Um, we'll see this afternoon when I head up towards um, the, the pan, if they're all three of them together. Maybe, maybe all three males are there together. Now, LMI, you are asking, you are asking um, if there's been any any sign or news on the little cubs that uh, that we found the other day. No, not yet. Um, I don't believe anybody has managed to follow that lioness again back to the den. Oh, I don't think anybody has. So I haven't heard anything. Um, so you've got to. I'm not sure, I think that was the lioness that we saw this morning again at the kill. She went and drank water and then of course one of those males followed her um, and she won't want to take the male back to the den. So I think she was trying to give him the slip again but she was resting there this morning and most likely went a little bit later back to the den. But what we'll do is when we go back into that area where the males were, we'll have a look around, see if the female is still there. Uh, maybe she is, she could have left the cubs for the day. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe she'll go back a little bit later. If she's still there, maybe she's gone back already. Um, but like I said, when we found the cubs, because it is still a very sensitive area, um, and I suggested to everyone else, um, um, and not many people know where that den site is, uh, which is probably better, but I think they should only go and view them if they follow the lioness back to the den because those little cubs are still very small um, and it's we don't want to we don't want to put too much pressure on them at that young age to have too many vehicles moving around that could potentially cause too much activity around there and might attract other predators and scavengers like hyena and we know and I've seen in the past hyena do t tend to pick up on movement of vehicles so we don't want that we'll only go there if we're following the lioness then the, then it would be fine so we'll see maybe she's around tomorrow if we find her, we can try to follow her. Um, who knows? We may get to see them again in the next few days. That would be great. <laughs> uh, often lions, when they are full, they tend to lie on their back like that. Their bellies up in the air. <laughs> it's quite funny to see them like this. Greek, you are asking how will a lion know if um, other lions come into their territory? Well, I suppose technically with them being here, they won't know for now. But with them patrolling, they'll probably pick up on the scent. If the other lions call, perhaps, um, then they'll definitely know. They'll definitely recognize the sound and call of a, of a new, new male or, or new lions in the area. So... Um, uh, that would be one way, but other than that, the scent, they'd pick up on the scent if they came across that area that those lions came into. It must definitely the scent. I can hear a little African barred owlet calling. 
African barred owlet um, calling in the distance. Let's see if maybe we can find it. I don't know. It's quite far from here, though. And all of you saying this male lion looks very comfortable. It does indeed. I think there's a picture of James Henry actually in this position on the beach um, when he was off recently. <laughs> Senza, you're not meant to laugh so much. <laughs> Only joking, James. <laughs> Miss you, buddy. <laughs> Thankfully, no one, no one will ever tell James that I said that. <laughs> Look, look, <laughs> poor move, Dave. <laughs> I wonder if he's, what's he doing with those paws? Uh, John, um, uh, your question, uh, my friend and, and business partner, Ryan, actually can't believe my answer. But, uh, John, you were asking if, um, if I've ever been charged by lions on foot. And, uh, John, I haven't. Touch wood. Touch wood. I'm not saying it's not going to happen because I still track and look for lions constantly. So, at some point it may happen. But, um, no, I've never been charged. I've been growled at. Once or twice, literally once or twice, um, by lions, on foot, um, but no charge, uh, which, which is, I'm, I'm thankful for because I'm sure it's a, it's quite a scary experience. But I haven't been charged. I, I, I don't, I don't know why. I mean, I, <clears throat> when I worked um, permanently guiding at a at a lodge, my friend Judas who I've mentioned a number of times, the tracker that I worked with. I learned a lot from him in terms of tracking, and he was very alert. We found many lion prides, and we found leopards, and, um, and we, were, we were never charged. Him and I were never charged by any of those predators. But, um, again, we were always very, very careful, and, and you have to be alert when you are tracking. So sometimes he would look down and look at the tracks and I would walk close by and just scan the area a bit or if I'm looking down at something he'd look around. Um, it, it's wonderful when you've got that partnership, that relationship with someone that you work so closely with, especially in the bush, because you are there to keep each other safe when you're looking for animals. But um, no, so thankfully no charge by lions. All right, well, I'm probably going to leave this mail. We'll go see if we can find the other mails while I do that. Let's head across to James, who's enjoying the setting sun and a lioness. I hope he's not in his favorite pose at the moment. <laughs> ah, right, I see. Okay, sorry, I got a bit confused there. I didn't know this was my favourite pose, but I do quite like it. We're sitting here with the setting sun behind us. We've come back to the lions because I think it's going to get dark, like I said, a little faster than it might otherwise. It might also rain, and so we just need to be sort of standing still if that does happen. Oops, I've just pushed a whole lot of buttons, David. Are we still broadcasting? Oh dear. Are we still there, Rebecca? So just hit oh, there we go. Sorry, I, I kicked the monitor. I couldn't see what was there. We go. We're okay now. <laughs> okay. And they do seem to be getting up and a little bit more active, but I think that's just the precursors before they get up and actually do something useful. I'm a little worried by the lack of prey species around here. There were wildebeest heading here a little bit earlier and some zebra, but they are around. So I think 
this is definitely the pride to be with at the moment. Although, yeah, we'll see what they do. As the sun goes down, we might have to go looking for some others. But the scene is very pretty with a pinkening sky behind. We did have a little smattering of rain, but not too much at the moment. For those of you who have just joined us, this is the Sausage Tree Pride, a.k.a. The Sausages. And they, I, I'm told, five lionesses and a number of cubs. We've only got two lionesses here, and we've got four cubs. And I wonder if the others aren't in amongst the herds. Perhaps on the escarpment we might pop up there if, when it gets dark and see if we don't find something going on there. Because at the moment these lot are sleeping very soundly. Now David said to me as we came out here, he said, did they look hungry this morning? And I said to him, as I say to you now, that I don't believe any predator is hungry at the moment in the Mara. I think they're all very well fed, but... Of course, the opportunity, if it arises, to kill, well, they'll take it. And as far as fatness goes, I don't think that this bunch are particularly fat. I think they have definitely been fatter. They probably ate a small wildebeest last night. I don't know if you were with us this morning, but we followed them down here from quite a way out. And I think... I thought they were, the lionesses were bringing the cubs to a kill. I wonder if they weren't bringing them down here to rest. Well, they clearly were, but because they had eaten something the night before. So maybe last night they had a young wildebeest, ate it, and then came back to this place that Dave says that he's seen them spend quite a lot of time. This is my first time with the sausages. What has she seen? can't see anything. I'm looking with my binoculars, powerful as they are. Ooh! What have you seen, my dear? What has arrested your leonine slumber? You see anything, David? Maybe it's a small warty wandering through the bushes. Let's watch her very carefully. The other lioness is looking in the same direction. The cubs are sort of looking about gormlessly. They don't really know what's going on. It's pretty normal. There's something there. Both lionesses looking. Definitely looking quite excited. One of the cubs is also looking in that direction. I'm still scanning the grass for any movement. I'm going to guess that she's sensed a warthog. And by sensed, I don't mean in the telepathic way. I mean she smelt it, heard it, or seen it. The reason I think it's a warthog is because I can't see what's going on here. And only a warthog, or well, I suppose very small, or something like that would be invisible to our eyes. Hmm. I can just sense from her now a slight relaxation of her attention. David, you can't see what she's looking at, can you? If she goes on the hunt, Rebecca, if she gets off this termite mound and slinks off, I think we better go Facebook. If you know what I mean. Camp, you want to know why lions have hairy elbows? Well, Cap, the same question might be asked of me. Why do I have hairy armpits? Uh, the answer is lost somewhere in the midst of evolutionary time. I certainly can't see any reason for my hairy armpits. Um, I'm being obviously very facetious. I don't think they have unusually hairy elbows. I think maybe it's the fact that the skin is loose there. 
and so perhaps the hair just I don't know it's a bit longer I've probably got to do with the length of the skin I don't think there's any adaptive reason for having hairy elbows David do you have hairy elbows David does not have hairy elbows everybody he has got very long hair but he does not have hairy elbows oh get up and go and hunt something come on Anyway, whatever it is might come closer. We'll see as time passes. Otherwise, what else can I hear? Let's just have a little bit of a sound session here. I have found, and Judy H., my old bush teacher from my Juma days, and uh, latterly now, of course, because I'm back out in the field a bit more, said to me, asked me if the whining sound she heard was an insect the other night and I had to admit to her that I thought perhaps it was uh, a technical glitch because I find that it is very silent in the grasslands. Yes, you can hear the odd uh, grasshopper going tick, 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 tick. but otherwise most of the sound that we hear comes from the treed areas, from the woodlands up on the escarpment and in the drainage systems and the luggers. But here, it is really very silent indeed. Now, Fiona, you ask a very good question about prize, and you say, how many are there in the area? Fiona, um, let's count them together, and I'll tell you kind of where we are with them. So, Fiona, there are up from the north of the Mara Triangle. In fact, I've got a little map here. Let me get my map, which is in a book. It's a book over here. <coughs> the branding of which I'm not allowed to show you in case you rush out and buy it and give the poor author some kind of undue credit that he doesn't deserve. <laughs> you know, these authors, they're rolling it. You don't want to give them too much bucks. <laughs> you don't want them going out and buying a Ferrari tomorrow because I've shown you the name of the book. <laughs> this map here. All right, here we have the Mara Triangle. That's where we are. There's the Greater Masai Mara. Um, oh, we know the triangle obviously better because we live up here, which is quite close by to where we are now. We're over here now. We're just about there. So in the north, we've got the Ololo Pride and some others sort of that leak onto this northern section from one of the conservancies over here. This is all conservancy land, so it's all conservation land. Then we've got the Angama Pride, which we know very well. Then we have the Sausages, Sausage Tree Pride. They're over here in this area. And then down kind of along the river, we've got the Mogoro Pride, and then we've got the Paradise Plains Pride and the Serena North Pride. All of those prides, I think, the Magoros, the Paradise Plains and the Serena North Pride have at one time or other been part of the same group of lions. I think they're all related and I think we see them with each other quite often. But because people come in, look at the lions, leave, go and look for something else, I'm not sure that our understanding of the lion dynamics here is nearly as good as it is in a place like Kasabi Sands. Then we've got the Egyptian Goose Pride around this area here. We've got the Salt Lake Pride around this area here. That's where the Salt Licks are. We've got the Burungat Pride around here. There's a lot of lions, isn't it? I didn't think about this. There's a huge group of about 22 uh, very skittish lions that Brent has spent a lot of time with over there and probably something called the Escarpment Pride up around that area. So that pretty much covers the Mara Triangle. And then the Paradise Plains Pride, Paradise Pride, 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 they go across the river and they come into the Paradise Plains over here. Okay, let's go live. Go live to Facebook. Lines up. No, she's down. Hold your horses. <laughs> Sorry, she got up and she looked like she was going into a full stalk. Okay. I know, we nearly went live. Hang on, everybody, I'll get back to you with the prize. What I'm going to do is move slightly so we get behind her and maybe we can see what she's looking at. They both look, it's an ostrich. It's an ostrich. 
Can you see it, Dov? Mm. Just behind those bushes there. In this direction. Uh, yeah, that direction. You're on it. Right. Are you? No, you're not. Go left. Quite a long way left. It's now in the open. It's an enormous feathered thing, black in colour, with a huge neck on it. No, not yet. There we are. <laughs> Looks like a huge grouping of feather dusters with a head. There it is. Well spotted. Now, we know lions do actually kill ostriches. And the sight of that happening would be quite something. I think that ostrich would almost have to trip over this pride, I'm afraid, though, before they gave that ostrich a go. Let me just move the car slightly so Dave can get a better angle because he's going to catch the pole shortly. I moved on. There we go. I've now parked him at a very jaunty angle. Alrighty. You got him there. Big male ostrich. And the lion's no longer interested. Gone flat, asleep. It would be quite something to watch them hunt an ostrich. Right, so we can, while you're looking at the lions, I'll just quickly describe, I'm not going to point out the territories, but the other side of the river there, we've got the Silas Pride, we've spent some time with them. Uh, the Burungat Pride goes across the river as well. And we have got, what else have we got? We've got the Runkai Valley Pride and a couple of the Black Rock Pride. And that's about all of them that I know, but there are obviously a lot more than that. Scott spent some time with a lovely pride up around the Runkai Valley at one stage. Um, Jonathan, you're wondering if I've ever been charged by a lion on foot, and um, apparently Baron has not been charged by a lion on foot. I'm surprised Byron didn't make up a story about being charged by a lion on foot. That's very facetious, but... It <laughs> on you, Byron. Um, I have not been properly charged by a lion. I've had one or two lions stand up and growl, but not uh, not a major charge, no. And that's not to say I haven't seen many lions on foot. It's just that lions are not generally prone to trying to kill us. And if you're careful enough, and if you walk with a tracker that is skillful enough, well, then you probably won't be charged. Um, Herbert's favourite thing when we're at Juma is to uh, <laughs> is to say, now you're going to dance, he says to us as we go tracking lions. And what he means by that is you're going to jump up and down when we find them because they're going to come charging at us. But he says that just to make us a little bit nervous. All right, let's go back to Byron, who's had success with two more male Birmingham lions. We found the two brothers. Um, I've had a look around. They actually moved from where they were this this morning, this afternoon. Oh, there we go. It's a bit better. Thanks, Enzo. No, so they did move. Probably about uh, oh, sixty or eighty meters from where they were this morning. Um, I don't see. I don't see the other male. Or the female. Leo, you asked if these Birmingham males, this coalition, or these male lions will hunt on their own. Uh, yes, definitely. Look, if they, um, if they, the male lion, <laughs> or what to do on walks and how to approach wildlife, and um, and we did a a walk uh, into those male lions. We viewed them from a distance, we, um, we, we got fairly close, one lifted its head, looked at us, but we weren't, we weren't close enough that, um, that it felt threatened, so um, we got to view them on foot at Mapojo Coalition, and James was obviously with us, he took us on the walk, it was very interesting to see and, uh, and great to get that close to, to those big male lions that were around for so long, um, but yeah, no, no charge. No charge. <laughs> now these males, just as I thought, they're still very, very um, comfortable, and um, and they are 
resting, the full bellies, um, so... So there's probably no reason for them to move anytime soon. Now, Lindsay, you inquiring about those flies and why do so many flies sit on the lions or infest the lions at a time? Well, well, Lindsay, the, I suppose um, the main reason is that the lions probably aren't very clean. They've also got, um, they've been feeding on a buffalo for the last three days. So they don't smell very, very good. Um, so that's the one reason. But remember, these these flies sit on all animals out here, but especially these lions and some of the predators that probably aren't that clean, don't smell very clean. Um, I mean, there's most likely still a lot of that scent of that buffalo carcass on them. So that would be one of the main reasons why those flies are all sitting on those lions. sitting around there with these lines. Uh, Darlene, you're asking if the animals keep us up at night with all the calls. Um, some, sometimes, sometimes if they are, the, the, you know, very close to camp, we will wake up and, and, and I mean, so I've tried to go out and see if I can see them from time to time, the leopards and the lions. Um, but I, I must be honest, Darlene, there's actually nothing better than lying in bed at night and listening to the sounds of the of the animals, the lions, the hyena, the leopard perhaps. Um, you, might hear, you might hear an elephant. If you're close to a river, you'll definitely hear the hippo at night too, um, a river or a dam. But it's great to hear the sounds at the moment lying in camp at night you can hear a variety of owls the white-faced scops owl the pearl spotted owlets uh, the scops owl and the uh, barred owlet i've been hearing all those owls at night so i don't think they keep us up but it's always nice and especially if you're waking up early you'll hear a lot of the animals like these lions because they have been so close to camp they've been calling every night and every morning it's been great to hear them. I don't know if they'll call tonight. You never know. Maybe we're lucky. Um, that one male who was by himself that we saw earlier, um, he did call this morning, and that triggered these males. They then called. So, um, so hopefully he decides to call again. And maybe these males will then return the call. And the reason for that is, of course, the um, just just the um, I mean, marking their territory and um, and letting other lions know that this is their territory and this is you know this is um, their range and that no other lions should come in. And also that they know where each other are. These lions are able to pinpoint one another from those calls. They know exactly where they are. Fiona, you asked if lions snore. Fiona, I have, I have heard lions snoring. Um, I have before. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, I suppose these animals can sometimes, but uh, not not often. I mean, but I have heard I have heard male lions snore. Oh, 
All right, well, I'm going to spend probably the rest of the drive with these beautiful males, and hopefully we get some activity from them. Uh, let's head across to Scott, who's enjoying the sunset. Well, certainly good prospects there with Byron and those big male lions. We have stopped briefly to show you the sunset. We've had a interesting afternoon. The road that you joined me down for a short section as we turned off a main road ended up disappearing into nothing. And then we got caught in some rain as we were first trying to set up a shot to show you the sunset. So we have unflapped one of the covers in order to show you this and we will now be taking the rest back up. The rain seems to have stopped for now. So that is an update from us. Hello Aunt Jo. How are you doing? You would like to know what I like best about the Mara and I guess it's the open expanses and plentiful game. Um, there's no place quite like it, especially during the migration. So I guess to sum it up, the vistas and the ridiculous abundance of wildlife and action that goes along with it. So here you can see the flaps we've got kind of down. Um, so those are what we are going to be flopping back onto the roof in order for us to be able to continue. The rain seems to have stopped for now. I hope it has so that we can continue searching for some kind of an action um, to try and show you guys once the sunset safari comes to a close. James and I will stay out for a little bit to see if there's anything lurking around that is worth showing you. So that's the plan. I'm not sure where exactly I'm going to end up, but for now, I know where you're going, and that is with Byron with the Sleepy Lions. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> well, we're still sitting with these lions. We've just repositioned slightly, um, but they're very, very comfortable at the moment. No, I still haven't seen any sign of that uh, f uh, the, the female and the male uh, that we saw together earlier um, oh, maybe maybe w w what happened this morning or earlier today is what we saw yesterday she moved off he followed her for a while and eventually lost interest I don't know I don't know but he was definitely being a pain Debbie, these lions are completely aware. They are completely, completely aware of um, their surroundings. Um, they, yeah, I mean, they look fast asleep. I can guarantee you, if I got out of this vehicle now, and, or just put my foot on the floor and rubbed it against the grass, that they would lift their heads up. Um, they, they, I mean, they... It's amazing, actually, how alert they are. And it's a different sound. Uh, my foot, if it had to touch the ground, it's a completely different sound to the vehicle. They're used to that. Um, I mean, they're used to the sounds of voices now, so, but that they associate with the vehicle is no threat or danger, but I can guarantee you, my foot, just um, brushing up against the grass or something like that, they would, they would lift their heads up. Now, um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to do it now because I don't, I don't want to disturb the lions, um, and again, you know, we sh we shouldn't we shouldn't interfere in that way. But um, but I, I can guarantee you that um, that if we if I did do that, they would lift their heads most likely, and they'd look this way. It's amazing how alert they are. I've watched lions resting like this at about four o'clock in the afternoon, a very warm afternoon, summer afternoon, and um, in the shade resting and we were sitting there with guests and all of a sudden a impala came running through bounding through 
and noticed too late that it ran right into the pride of lions and when i say within seconds not the females the males were up and caught this impala pulled it down right in front of us and fed on it and within within 25 minutes the entire impala had been finished and they were fast asleep just like these lions are and that's why i know i mean some people uh, occasionally say the flat cats and everyone teases me because i don't like that term i, I really don't i don't know why <laughs> no, it's just a joke and but I, I, I never ever say flat cats because they're not they're still completely aware and alert of what's going on around them <laughs> taylor and and um tristan they often tease me on purpose <laughs> Fiona, the digestive system of the lions is pretty quick. I, I would guess it would take them two or three days and they would have digested this entire meal. Um, I mean, it's a lot of meat that they fed on. And um, what the lions do, they all, uh, they'd also probably try and feed in the next two or three days. The last evening chorus or early evening chorus of a lot of the birds. There's some there were babblers, um, Franklin's calling. Let me see what else I can hear calling. Um, pause. You asked if I've ever seen a lion kill a hyena before. Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't. Um, I'm just trying to think now. No, I haven't, unfortunately. Um, there was, I think it was the, was it the Mapojo Coalition? There was a time on Londolozi where um where hyenas the hyena population grew and um and they were attacking a lot of the lionesses and trying to push them off kills and that i think this was 2009 2010 somewhere around there and um and when was it yeah yeah about that and these the hyenas were, were putting a lot of pressure on the lions and I, I don't know if it's a sixth sense or if these lions knew that it became an issue and they they came in one day these males and i think they killed three hyena um very very quickly they ran through caught a clan and killed three hyenas um and that sorted out the problem very quickly i mean <laughs> the hyenas were not as uh, as aggressive and um but yeah that that and, so, and again, you know, that's a balance. That's nature's way of, of keeping a balance. Now, there was an interesting story um, with... Sorry, I'm just going to move like this. I often talk to the back of the vehicle like this. It's a bit more comfortable. Um, so we had a pride of lions um, on Londolozi known as the Tsalala Pride. <clears throat> and this pride of lions been there for many, many years. There was an old lioness that had two cubs um, but th they were about three years old four years old and in 2000 and 
I think it was 2007, 2008. They were feeding on a carcass, and the hyena came in and chased them and threatened them, and the two younger lionesses ran, and the eldest lioness stayed and tried to defend the carcass, and his hyenas attacked her and actually bit her tail, but bit her tail off completely, almost at the base. So she had no tail anymore. She was known as the tailless lioness then, from then on. Um, and in 2009, the same thing happened to one of the other, um, or one one of the other lionesses, one of her offspring, they were at a kill again, and then since then they had had some cubs in that, and the whole pride was feeding on a carcass. Hyenas came in, chased off the pride, and this lioness then stood her ground and tried to defend it, and hyenas attacked her and also bit her tail off. So there were two lionesses in the same pride that were missing tails. So what happened to the mother happened to the daughter too, two years later, which was amazing. But um, you know, so that was interesting. It didn't affect the lions at all. They were still able to hunt. They carried on, and they were very successful. The eldest lioness um, then raised uh, raised some cubs, and um, and uh, they now formed their own pride, known as the Mangen pride, of four lionesses. And then I think they've had they've had cubs since then. And that eldest lioness died eventually of old age. Then the other tailless lioness, she stayed in the Talala pride, and she still um, was around. I don't think she's around anymore, though. Um, I actually, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm going back to Londolosi next month, so I'll, I'll find out and double check while I'm there and see what what the pride dynamics are at the moment. I'm looking forward to going back there. I'm going to be guiding there for a week, um, so see seeing the leopard dynamics, lion dynamics. Things always change, which is great. Okay, well, <laughs> let's go across to James and the Mara, and he's got lions, a pride of lions, and they still have all their tails. <laughs> Obviously. Oh dear, they've got some tech issues with James. That's not ideal. Well, sure. <clears throat> it's okay, it's okay. We're still sitting with our lions. They're not moving. I was hoping they would, though. Darlene, you asked if I think these these lines would. St you asked if these lines would stay in the area um, for for very long. Um, Darlene, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure. Sorry, I'm just trying to set up some lights here for us. Let's see. Sensor uh, is that a little a little bit better? Sorry, we don't actually. Since our dear friend Connor Teagues has left us, um, we're struggling a little bit with tech, and the lights on Wendy, for some reason, have stopped working. I don't know what's wrong, Wendy. Why don't you want to shine for me? <laughs> the, the, the front LED lights aren't working. Um, and believe it or not, but I'm not a technical person. I would not be able to go and fix the lights. The wiring is all a little confusing for me. You know, it's uh, it's not one of the things I'm good at. Cooking and guiding? Yeah, 
fixing lights on a vehicle? Probably not. <laughs> Still waiting for a for my breakfast video. I've, I've been waiting patiently to see when that breakfast video is going to come out. I know it sounds like James has fought off some of the gremlins. Let's go to him again and see if everything is okay. We are doing our best. I think everything is A-OK. -okay. Rebecca, can you hear us? Can you hear us when we speak to you? Rebecca? Hello? Oh, good. Well done, everybody. So, we're, the lions are slowly waking up. The cubs are having a bit of a clean and a play. They're being very cute. And I'm hoping the adults will get up very shortly indeed. Oh, look. Now they're having a little bit of a cuddle which one should do on a chilly afternoon, and then they're biting each other's faces, which one shouldn't do, ever. Now, it did get a bit rainy, I'm afraid, but now it's stopped. We've put one flap down, but we seem to be very nicely sheltered as we watch these little cubs go about their sort of leonine cub business. The mums are still fast asleep. We haven't spotted them doing anything. There we go. Her eyes are open. They were just obscured slightly there by some grass. Yeah, you know, they might get up. What I'm going to do is sit here probably until about half an hour after dark, I think. And thereafter, we'll make the decision as to whether to go and try and find some others or stay here. Perhaps the rest of the sausage pride. Tree pride. The sun is now well gone, and it's amazing how quickly it's going to get dark. This camera that we're using now is the Emmy Winning, as it's called by Jandre, Emmy Winning, and it basically is sucking the last little bits of light out to the extent that I really can't. I could just make out where the lions are with my naked eye, but nothing like the way this camera is sucking the last bits of light out of the ambient atmosphere. You can't have an ambient atmosphere. Uh, that's a tautology, David. I do apologize. And the ostrich has moved on. The wildebeest that were coming this way have moved on. The zebra that are coming this way have moved on. So who knows? We might be lucky, we might not. Remember, of course, we are completely live from Masai Mara. You can talk to us using the hashtag Safari Live, and it is always easier at a flat cat sighting uh, to have some commentary and questions to start a conversation, everybody. And if you're wondering why on earth we're sitting here with lions that are doing absolutely nothing at all, remember our goal here in the Mara is to view the migration through the eyes of the predators and so once it gets dark it becomes quite difficult to find cats of course and that's when they normally go on the hunt and so once we get to this stage of the day we hunker in with a pride or a group of cheetah if we have those in Scott's case sometimes across the river and then we wait and see what they do and often they get up and they go hunting and it becomes very exciting indeed There is a very large group of wildebeest off behind us, but they're about, I'd say, a mile away from these lions. And so for them to go and hunt those wildebeest, I think is not going to, it's, it's not going to, um, I don't think it's going to happen. The reason I'm giggling there is because I thought I was sipping on my coffee so very quietly until Rebecca said, what are you drinking over there? I do apologise profusely. It's highly unprofessional. I shouldn't be doing that while we're on drive. Uh, I shan't do it again. I thought I was doing it so quietly. <laughs> this microphone's obviously much better than I thought it was. <laughs> Hello, Cluck, as in the sound that a chicken makes. Um, you want to know what my ideal day in the bush would look like? Well, okay, I'll tell you. 
it would begin, obviously before dawn, David is now cringing, it would begin before dawn, <clears throat> probably at about, I'd say at four o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, just before it got light. And then what I'd quite like to do is head out in the vehicle with a very well-stocked cooler box or hot box of coffee and go and sit somewhere as the horizon turned grey and then of course slightly pink and then it turned to the dawn sky because as you do that of course you can hear the lions calling it's the changing of the guard it's the best time to be out the smells change the breeze changes and then i guess i would probably have my coffee and then i would go for a walk and the walk would hopefully take in one predator sighting uh, possibly a leopard on foot, that would be great. It might definitely take in a rhino sighting a little bit later where I could sit on a termite mound and the rhino came walking around the termite mound and didn't know I was there. And then it would take in probably a, an extensive period of walking along a river in amongst the forests, hopefully seeing one or two elephants as I went also, them not having any idea that I was there, except perhaps for one big bull who would just eye me out of his right eye as I walked past, saying to me, I know you're there, but I don't mind, so you just keep on going, old buddy, old pal. And then I suppose I would stop at round about 10 o'clock, uh, where I would have pre or, or designed to meet someone like Byron, of course, who's an excellent cook, and I'd meet him there and eat a breakfast that he'd cooked for me, uh, for, probably with less peri-peri than he and his ilk would put on it, but I would definitely have a nice breakfast there. Then I think it would be down to the riverside, where I would sit and read a book, a tome of some description, and doze gently as the heat of the day built, and slowly, I know I'll probably spend quite a lot of time there, maybe I'd do a bit of birding in amongst the forests, and then as the afternoon came, I'd probably head out on another walk and see what else I could find, and hopefully find a very sort of brilliantly high vantage point on which I could sit and watch the dying of the day with a very fine scotch in a crystal glass with just two pieces of ice and a drop of water. And then I think I would go home quite satisfied. There you go. Okay. Right, we're going to move to infrared now. And Byron apparently thinks that um, my perfect day would consist of him driving me around. Um, I'm going to leave that uh, where it stands. All right, we're going to move to infrared now, which means your picture is going to lose the colourful luster it has now, although luster is a very strong term for what it has. David, are you ready? Yes. On the count of three? Mm -hmm. One, two, three. There we go. There we go. Now, so obviously, I must just say to you that it is an extremely skillful job, this job that the cameramen do. They don't just sort of waft a lens in the general direction of the animals that they are, we're looking at. It is very hard to find, especially in black and white, when you're used to seeing in colour. We are diurnal creatures. We are not nocturnal. And so to operate like this is really quite difficult and of course the dimmer the light gets the more difficult it gets to find focus and what you're seeing here well these guys are the top of their game as far as the live wildlife filmmakers go possibly is the top of their game as the non-live because they're so much faster than most other cameramen and women because they have to be you only get one chance when you're live. All right, let's head across to Baran, who apparently is in a very, very dark space indeed. I'm sorry, Byron. I do hope that you will cheer up. All right, now, I've just left those lines, and I'll tell you why, because I've heard monkeys alarm calling, they're going mad, they've clearly seen a predator moving around here. Now, I don't know if it's one of the other lions, uh, the other male that was around, or is it perhaps a leopard? The problem is, 
the problem is they're down in close to camp and down in a drainage line i can't get down there and i don't know because it's dark i can't see where they're looking but it sounded like possibly closer to maybe maybe the pan maybe the water hole. just listen for a second you can actually hear them Yeah, that? Okay, so that's what I'm following. The sound of those monkeys alarm calling. Oh, wouldn't it be great to try and finish off with the leopard? Now, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know if it is a leopard. Um, there's no one else around here. It's just us. So, we'll have a look. actually going to drive right down here because these drainage lines and that around maybe maybe whatever it was that was walking through here has walked through this drainage line down to the water possibly coming for a drink I'm not sure I know there is a little gap that we can take to get down there There's, there's a little scrub here. I doubt the monkeys were alarm calling at that. Now I actually would like to just drive up that drainage line a little bit because I think Chandler or Chandler, you asked, do I prefer to explore the bush during the day or night? Well, to tell you the truth, I prefer during the day because it's easier to see. It's uh, difficult now at night and we try and rely on a spotlight, but but it's very, very difficult. I'm hoping we find something here, everyone. I'm not sure. It's tricky if you can't see exactly where those monkeys are, alarm calling. Something could have come down and disappeared up in one direction or headed away from here. Chanda, definitely during the day, it's just easier to see. I mean, the, the night time in the bush is wonderful. Those monkeys are still alarm calling. They haven't stopped. No, I also don't know, did they see something? around Gallego Pan or heading in that direction oh, it's difficult now I'm actually driving right in front of the lodge but fortunately the guests are all out and James you're saying you think it's time for a last minute leopard huh, wouldn't that be great they're sitting right at the top of the trees so whatever they saw must have been in this area so but the thing is the monkey's eyesight is so good that they can see something from quite a distance away also if, the, if a leopard has been spotted and and um, is being alarm called at then it usually tries to get out of the area quite quickly it won't necessarily hang around for very long now those uh, monkeys have stopped sounds like they've stopped Oh, we unfortunately can't go any further down here. You know what, we'll do a little loop around again. Maybe, maybe we get lucky and see something on the road. But those mon actually, those monkeys are still alarm calling.
This is always exciting. I love this because yeah, it's the, the, the thrill of the, the seek, um, of looking for these animals, you know, trying to rely on the clues that have been given to us, the monkey's alarm calling, and then to try and find an elusive predator, whether it be a leopard or a lion, I don't know. All right, well, um, I'm going to have a look around here. Let's head across to Scott, who's in the darkness of the Mara at the moment. Welcome back. And I must say, I am very jealous and in agreement with Byron regarding alarm calls being one of the most exciting things you get to do and follow up on when on safari. Sadly, we don't get much of a cheer, at least not from vervet monkeys. They're one of the best security animals, which let off the alarm. And I guess it's because they perched up quite high in the trees quite often. And they've got incredible eyesight. So during the day, they can spot things from a long, long distance off. And who knows, hopefully Byron will still get lucky. He's certainly in that area. So with a bit of luck and a few more clues, a few more alarm calls possibly from other animals, he could get lucky. We are just driving through the bushes here. Well, not really the bushes, the plains, hoping to spot some predators you know if I prefer being out in the bush uh, during the daytime or the nighttime both certainly have their perks the morning has its perks over the afternoon and the afternoon its perks over the morning um, but what I must say is that being out at night and having special permission to be out after dark in the Mara is a great privilege and I've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it Probably because it's a bit of a novelty, it's a new thing that we've been able to do because the technology has allowed for us to do that with the incredible thermal cameras and the infrared cameras and the combination of the two. Um, so yes, I wouldn't be able to pick any one time. Um, they all have their, their perks, but like I say, we have been, it's kind of a bit of a new treat that we've been allowed to spend the whole nights out following the animals which has been wonderful but like most things in life each thing has its pros and cons so if we do spot any animals we want them to be on the left hand side of this road because we can off-road on the left hand side we cannot off-road on the right so there's actually a couple of lines that we spent a little bit of time with last night on the right hand side of the road just off this turn off actually and we were hoping they were going to head west but they didn't so we just had to wave them goodbye but yeah thankfully not all of us are searching for lions some have already found them and Let's go and see, well, why don't you guys go and see what James's lions are up to. Um, my lions are up to not much, but the wind is starting to blow this cover onto my head. So I'm just going to get it out of the way. The lions are not doing much, but they have sat up at least, which was very kind of them to at least make that effort on our behalf. So like I said, I think we'll sit with them to the end of the drive and then we'll make a decision on whether to go and look for some others or give them another chance to try and hunt. There we go, I fixed my cover. Now, what I wanted to ask all of you is if you thought that their ears were more boxy than the ones at Juma. So if you look at the face of this lioness and the ones of, say, Amber Eyes, who is probably thinking about buffalo as this lioness thinks about wildebeest, do you agree with me that their ears are a different shape? I think they are. While you consider that, using the hashtag Sorry Live, uh, you can also, or oh no, sorry, you can't also, I'm going to answer the question from John, and John says, you want to know what my favourite thing about lions is? John, I think it's probably the cubs. 
I think I really enjoy um, spending time around the cubs. I find the adults' attitude to life slightly distasteful, to be honest. I know that will offend some people. In fact, they've probably taken to Twitter now to pillory me. But um, that's just because I'm a humanist, really. And, of course, lions are not distastefully behaved. They just do what lions do, and that's the most successful thing for them to do. But I find the um, lying about in the innards of a buffalo once they've killed it quite foul. Um, I find their, um, uh, their willingness to leave their comrades in arms to whatever fate it is that nature has ordained for them well, just not as appealing as the actions of, say, the wild dogs, which tend to look after their, their own a bit more than the lions do. So I think that would be my answer, John. Now, not only are we filming in IR, I also have a FLIR thermal camera, and um, I'm scanning the landscape. You unfortunately can't see the picture because it's not able to broadcast. And I'm scanning the landscape for bits and pieces of warmth and hoping to spot a great number of predators. I think I need to change some settings, David. Apparently everything is hot. Never mind. Ah, the great Byron Sorrell has managed to find whatever it is that is making the monkeys upset. He's very clever. Let's go to him. <laughs> we have indeed managed to find what those monkeys were alarm calling at. It's dark, um, but it wasn't elusive enough for us. Have a look at this, everyone. We've managed to find a leopard. I'm going to turn the light off. Let's use infrared. Hold on a second, the infrared will kick in. There we go. Wonderful, look at that. Uh, this looks like a female. Um, we'll try to see. I, I mean, I have no idea who this is. Isn't that wonderful? Look at that. Hey, so from lions listening and then listening to the monkey's alarm calling, I told you, I said I'm not sure if it's a lion or a leopard, possibly a leopard, because we had those lions lying down and those monkeys were alarm calling in a different area. James, you got your last minute spots that you wanted. Hey, what a, another great drive. This is, we've been very fortunate. This looks like a young female. Is this not, uh, is this, you know, I'm not even going to hazard a guess in case I get shouted at. <laughs> Tristan, are you watching? <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. You can see her eyes are glowing. Now, we're quite far away and she can't see any light with this infrared on, which is great. So it's, we're not disturbing her at all. It's actually so dark at the moment. We're sitting in the dark. I'm just going to turn that light off too. Wow, that is wonderful. It's amazing with this infrared that we're able to see these cats or nocturnal animals so clearly. I'm hoping she decides to go and have a drink. The call of the fiery necked night jars in the, in the background. That beautiful thick tail, that long tail. <laughs> See, now I wonder if this leopard can possibly smell the lions. Maybe that's why he's cautious looking around. This is spectacular. <laughs> I 
I'm giggling because I, I, I get so excited when, uh, you know, there's just something about when you are in the bush and especially working in the bush, um, if you, if you obviously been trained and you, you, you understand the bush a little bit better, but to use signs of the wild, like alarm calls or anything like that, or tracks, and then to find the potential predator or whatever you think it might be, it's it's so rewarding. And I still, I still to this day, after doing it for many, many years, I really, really love it. This is probably one of my favorite parts of guiding. And um, and it's just it's special. I mean, we've been we've been very fortunate. You know, the other morning we um, we stuck with that uh, lioness and we got to follow her back to the den. She took us to to her den site where she's got those three little cubs. That was a huge reward. And now to find this beautiful leopard, Sean, you asked how far this leopard is from the lions. Um, I would say. Probably 200 meters, short, 200 meters from where we had those lions. But those lions are fast asleep. I think they're still fast asleep back where we left them. And this leopard looks very alert. So. There's a Scops owl calling too. Um, so apparently a lot of the viewers, you are saying this is possibly Tandy. And I was going to say, that initially it looked like a, a young, younger leopard. Um, but I mean, yeah, looking at, if you look at, um, just under her belly, she's got some tufts of, of hair around there that looks like that of a female leopard that's, um, that has given birth before they get this little, um, a little pouch almost I suppose you could call it forming under the belly there you can see that and I was looking at the ears the ears do appear to be a little frayed so it's a little bit older and I mean but Tandy's not that old how old is Tandy now um, I wonder if anybody knows I can't remember again I get so confused with the leopard ages So forgive me for not remembering the, the ages. I do get confused a little bit with the different leopards that we see. Um, not just yeah, all that I see all over, different females and males. Yeah, it does look, if you look at those ears, it does look like a, a slightly older leopard. Oh, so Tandy was born in 2006. Okay, wow, well, so that's 11 years. Yeah, well, I suppose, but she still looks good, so about 11 years old. <laughs> it's sometimes difficult to see, you know, with these little screens that we've got exactly, um, and, and at night. But, um, but as I said, I can see what looks like to be uh, little frayed ears. appears to be very cautious, constantly looking around, listening, see how those ears are moving. Well, this was a great surprise. I'm going to sit here a little bit longer with this leopard. Let's head back to James, who's still sitting with his lions. Let's see if they're doing anything at the moment. Well, not... <laughs> I feel like I've said this a few times, not much is happening. They have perked up a little bit and then the rain started again, so they went back to sleep. One lioness, there was a male calling way in the distance, possibly one of the Birmingham boys. I'm joking, they can't really hear all the way to South Africa. Uh, and they popped up their heads a bit to see what was going on, but other than that, I'm afraid, not much has gone on. But they are relatively... Well, they seem to be waking up slightly. I feel like I'm talking hopefully here. So I'm going to give them a little bit longer before I go in search of something else. And there we are.
looking around and many of you agree that their ears do in fact look boxier than the ears of the lions we have at Juma. So I'm glad you agree with me. Thank you very much. Very kind of you to agree with me. It's nice to be agreed with, isn't it, David? Yes. And isn't it amazing? Ooh, I know what she's listening to. She's hearing to Zeb she's listening to Ze zebra alarm calling. Very far away though. And I was going to say that it's amazing how those black ears do look so um, obvious when you look at the lions in this colour. And I often used to think to myself, well, you know, it's all very well saying lions have got black ears in order for them to follow each other, but when they move it's normally at night, so how does that help? Well, I think this is the kind of contrast that lions see in at night, and you can see very quickly how everything else is quite white, but for the black of the back of their ears. So I think it's definitely a following mechanism for their little cubs and for each other when they're scanning around to see where their mates are as they plot the next ambush of whatever it is they're going to take out. This lot don't look like they're going to take out a great deal at all. And you are, quite a lot of you are agreeing with me that the thing you like most about lions are the cubs. Yes, I mean, they are just such fun, aren't they? They're the cutest animals we get out here, I think, by a country mile. Their noises are amazing, their antics are amazing. Yeah, I think they're great. But once they're over a year old or so, well, I mean, I don't need to cast aspersions on lions. I like lions very much. But they don't quite have the same appeal as the little babies. But well, isn't that the same with us all? I think I've become much less appealing since I was a baby. What about you, David? Or do you become more appealing by the day? No, same as you. Same as me. Oh, well, that's good. Yes, that lioness does not look like she's about to leap up and hunt. All right, let's go back to poor old Baron, who seems to have managed to lose the leopard. I don't know how he managed that. I mean, goodness gracious, this close to the end of the show. Pathetic effort. Uh, well, everyone, we've just lost that female leopard. She's moved down into this drainage line, and I don't think we're going to see her again. She looked like she was sneaking off through a nice thick area, possibly looking to hunt. Um, so unfortunately she did disappear. I was hoping we could maybe try to get another glimpse of her somewhere But I really can't see and there's absolutely no way for us to get down there very very thick But what a nice surprise to see her. That was amazing Very very great That was awesome nice to see the leopard who knows maybe in the morning possibly still be in this area um, so we'll definitely have a look around just still scanning you never know she could pop out she could pop out again Let's just check once more around here but um, but I wouldn't be surprised if she picked up on the scent of those of those lines and maybe decided she'd rather move off anyway I think that's all from us lovely afternoon let's go across to james he's going to end the show we'll see you tomorrow morning good night everyone there we go everybody i was just laughing at poor old byron's expense um byron and i in case you wondered everyone are, are very good friends so we don't dislike each other in the slightest although from some of the banter it might see seem that way um, there we are with our lion. As you can see, she's uh, tremendously active right now. She's considering uh, definitely leaping up and hunting any second now. And Diana, you're wondering before she lift, gets up and rushes off to hunt something, why do, you, do I think that these cats have got different ear shapes from the ones that are at Juma uh, or in the Kruger or in Botswana for that matter? I don't know, Diane, I really couldn't tell you. I don't think there's any real reason for it. I think you'll find that the geographical or spatial separation that there has been from the lions of the populations in the southern 
parts of Africa has been long enough for, you know, just a sort of drift, uh, what we call a drift towards a different shape. And I don't think it's any more than that. I don't believe that there is an adaptive advantage to having slightly boxier ears. I might be quite wrong, but I don't think that there is. I think if you were to catapult these lions into the Kruger, I don't think they'd have any trouble at all. Willow, you want to know if I'll be out staying, uh, or staying out all night? Uh, not all night, Willow. We'll stay out probably until about 9 or 10, depending on what's happening out here. Um, I'll give these lions another few minutes and then probably go off and see if we can't find some more so that we can try and get some Facebook broadcasts going. We have a few rolls and a couple more cups of coffee to have. We'll probably have those now and then head out and see what else we can find. <laughs> All right, everyone. This is a long time since I've had to do this. Uh, it's my great pleasure to say goodbye to you now. Uh, not because it's pleasurable to say goodbye, but pleasurable to end the drive. Ooh, there's something over there. Um, <laughs> Bye-bye, and thank you for joining us. We will keep you posted on anything that happens here. You can watch on Facebook. Thank you for your questions and comments. Big thank you to David on camera, and Rebecca in the front control, and Scott, and Byron, and everyone else involved.